Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. My name is Jyoti Panapalli, and I'm a director and a blockchain technologies lead at uh, DTCC. Uh, for those of you that don't know, DTCC is a post-trade uh, market infrastructure services provider um, for global financial services industry. Uh, we have about 21 global locations. Um, DTCC, along with its subsidiaries, centralizes, automates, and manages risk for um, the capital markets. And just to give you an idea about the scale, um, in 2021, we uh, processed securities transactions in the amount of 2.3 quadrillion US dollars. Now, in today's agenda, I'm going to uh, talk through a little bit about the complexities of blockchain security uh, when we started uh, implementing DLT, some of the challenges that we met. Um, DTCC's thought leadership in the uh, security landscape um, and uh, the leading that into the DLT security framework initiative that we put out. Um, the risks assessment of Hyperledger Bezu, and then I will also discuss some of the security assessment findings as well as the configuration best practices that we uh, uh, that we um, have put together. Um, that will lead further into the smart contract vulnerabilities, uh, best practices, and certification specs. So the nature of DLT itself um, is a huge complexity when it comes to uh, blockchain. The concept of decentralization and distributed nodes, the fact that a domain um, does not centralize and maintain all the nodes within the uh, borders or the boundaries of the corporate domain. Um, that led into emerging risks. So a significant lack of understanding of the threat landscape as well as the risks associated with it add on to further complex the um, security uh, posture for DLT applications. Now, a lack of guidance towards secure implementations is another complexity because uh, we all know that if you, you know, consider cybersecurity frameworks, they do um, assist with traditional IT security assessment significantly, but then there is uh, quite a bit of a gap between uh, DLD security and traditional IT security. Mm, developer community um, is not equipped with the correct tools and techniques that they would require to be able to do secure coding, secure coding best practices, um, secure deployment, as well as DevSecOps. Of course, we all understand that patching and upgradability on immutable ledgers is, is another complexity added on with continuous monitoring capabilities. So blockchain networks today, both um, public permissionless as well as private permissioned, are uh, running business workflows that involve transactions and custody of value in the form of digital assets. So cybersecurity attributes such as confidentiality, privacy, integrity of data do take the center stage for blockchain. But at the same time, compromise or hack of any of these um, attributes can result in high value business impact. That could be loss of trade, loss of funds, loss of trust and credibility for the entity, basically a high value impact for an organization. Um, so, as I mentioned, alluded earlier that DTCC's scale, at scale, the economies of scale, the, the requirement for them to be able to process trillions of transaction um, is, is, a, is, is, is their business model. So, risk management is at the core of what we do. So, corresponding to that, DTCC put out a white paper in 2020 more like a call to action to the financial services industry, inviting all financial industry stakeholders to collaborate and contribute to the best practices that will eventually uh, develop into an agreed upon standard by the financial services industry. And as I said, our role is to be able to effectively manage the risk and identify the appropriate countermeasures. So, 
for that purpose, we identified some of the security baseline, security assurance, standards, and we also proposed that this be achieved via some sort of a industry consortium. Security must be considered at all um, stages of DLT life cycle, which includes design, development, deployment, post deployment, governance and compliance. So the chart that you see up here illustrates 15 categories of um, security considerations that was gathered across um, 20 plus research um, artifacts and publications that was conducted uh, over multiple organizations. Um, the size of the block that you see is indicative of the fact that more count of organizations mentioned that category as a security consideration for them. One of the things we noticed was, you know, as the pace of, um, you know, development and using of DLT and blockchains increased, we also realized that internally we were accelerating our efforts but at the same time, we were also challenged with appropriate guidance towards securing these deployments. And when we were putting our thoughts together, I mean, if we were internally accelerating, we assumed that other financial services organization were also in similar position as us. Hence the white paper, hence this research. Now this actually helped us justify the fact that it's, it was not just us solo um, in the industry. There were other organizations that were thinking through these unique drivers. So having um, had this, this as a support, uh, we decided that the industry needs a DLT security framework. And the vision around it was we put together a few sets of goals for being able to develop that. One was that it should assist financial uh, services organizations um, to uh, evaluate the risks across an individual firm's um, secure assessments via best practices and tools. It should be able to assist with third party management, incident management. Um, this must address key aspects when it comes to uh, you know, key management life cycle, especially with respect to creation, um, creation, maintenance and storage, storage, as well as disposal of sensitive information. Um, this framework must also be able to provide security guidance and practice, uh, best practices when it comes to standard access controls, authentication methods, primarily be able to bridge the security gap between traditional IT uh, as well as DLT specific security. The first layer that you see up here are the alliances and the consortiums that we reached out to to collaborate as part of our planned efforts after we wrote, put out our white paper, uh, which was a call to action. And we created working groups, DLT specific security working groups, uh, or we partnered with um, working groups that were specific focused on building security artifacts and uh, research articles for security. The second layer that you see are the focus areas. And these are the focus areas that we created more like under the umbrella of DLT security framework. We created sub working groups that focused on the specific domains where we could put further together the, the skilled resources, the tools required, the resources required to be able to conduct research and develop security artifacts specific to that focus area. The third layer that you see are the platforms that we directly participated to deliver uh, publications in. So what you see um, up here is Hyperledger Foundation. We have published um, close to three artifacts um, that cater to security controls. Uh, in Hyperledger, we uh, participated with Enterprise Ethereum Alliance to, uh, to publish uh, security smart contracts, audit specification certification levels. 
as well as under the CSA umbrella again, we uh, participated to do to produce an architecture security report as well as a security controls checklist for R3 Corda. And as I mentioned, these are some of the security research publications that we published since we um, started our initiative in um, September of 2020. So um, that's a lot of work <laughs> that's been put out. So if you're interested in reading those articles, please feel free to go to CSA um, Cloud Security Alliance website and they're all uh, in public domain. Um, they're not behind a paywall. Um, so anybody can download, register at CSA and download um, those. But the eThrust security level spec is um, under Ethereum, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and that's also on a public domain. Uh, two of the research artifacts are work uh, in progress at the moment. Uh, so they will be published uh, either in Q1 or Q2 of 2023. Now, I cannot move past having announced our initiatives without thanking our contributor community. Um, this chart specifically shows our contributor growth and retention under CSA, but we have similar stats um, under other alliances as well. Now, I will dive into the Hyperledger Bezos security assessment um, that we conducted. Okay, so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. That was not the intent. Um, so, our efforts were centered around identifying the gap between traditional IT and DLT specific security. So, for any security assessments we conducted, we still leveraged the NIST cybersecurity framework as our basis, like something that we uh, used. So, we first identified the platform, whether it is Hyperledger Bezu, Hyperledger Fabric. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to... Um, you know, walk through the process that we implemented. Um, and we would identify the architectural risks by applying a threat modeling on an assumed use case um, that befits the platform under consideration. And then while, you know, we correspondingly, we implemented, uh, you know, the threat modeling and then developed an architecture security report. Along with that, we also developed a security controls checklist that directly ties into the functional domain um, as specified in the NIST. Now, the risk identification process comprises of three different layers. Um, first, we, um, the first layer we, we took as was DLT. The second layer that you see is Hyperledger Bezu. The third layer is Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Now, you may ask, they're all, you know, blockchains or DLT. The reason we split them into layers is the commonalities of a DLT platform or a blockchain. Our intent was to be able to abstract that commonalities across multiple platforms and then be able to roll that up into a company's policy and a control standard. If we don't un, uh, identify those commonalities, then, you know, for any DLT project that gets rolled out for any organization, it will be a challenge to develop policy and control standards. Um, every uh, DLT platform, you know, another complexity I forgot to mention was that every DLT platform has its own technology stack, which means that you probably will, you know, if you didn't have those commonalities, you might end up developing a separate exclusive policy guideline and a control standard guideline for each platform, which is a redundant process. So that's why we identified, let's see if we can abstract out any commonalities and then put them together as a policy guideline for an organization. And then of course, Hyperledger Bezu, which is again, you know, customized dApps, um, threat modeling on the dApps that were deployed, uh, an enterprise Ethereum alliance, given that it's a public permissionless environment, um, there might be risks that we have to identify, which the organization must be willing to accept, if not be able to mitigate. Our approach based on once we identified the risk areas of focus is one, co-create with the security teams. And the reason we say that it's, it's very important to loop in all the skilled resources from different squads and that brings us the shared best practices and experience for implementing a specific technology. 
And then once we had the squads together, we identify the threat model risks at a component and an enterprise level. Please bear the uh, reason I say enterprise level is eventually all of these have to be able to roll up into enterprise risk management framework. Currently, it's like down, uh, you know, at the component level, uh, which is again, you know, could end up being a redundant process down the line. We record risks to NIST cybersecurity framework, which is again, you know, the basis. Be able to quantify those risks, recommend short term, long term uh, risk acceptance plans and prioritize the remediation planning. Now our entire effort, I'm jumping the gun a little bit and showing this ahead of time. Um, our entire effort resulted in quantifying the risk we identified into specific functions. Now we grouped these uh, by cybersecurity function area. So as I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we group in the squads or the squads help us uh, build the mitigation steps. Now please bear uh, that this is a point in time slide. And what we identified here uh, was when we were conducting our assessments specific to the applications we deployed and the threat um, surface corresponding to those. Now you see the smart contracts, you know, shows a 67% and the secure configuration of Bezu shows like a 3% uh, risk. But this is a moving target. At any given point of time, that 67% on smart contracts could be down to 20% or up 80%. So uh, please bear, this is a point in time slide and this is... Um, you know, not universally applicable. Now, once uh, I'll now now I'll you know walk through the Hyperledger Bezu security assessment findings. So, our initial assessment of the known risks in the ecosystem resulted in Bezu being a well-defined and implemented Java client, which was good news. Uh, prior to assessment, prior to our assessment, we were of course not the first ones. Tevora, which is a third party, conducted. Um, uh, security audit on Bezu and identified primarily two vulnerabilities and to my knowledge both have been mitigated ever since in the iterative versions. Um, also what we found was that Hyperledger uh, Bezu had a development and a life cycle management which was found to be quite robust uh, with appropriate defect management and security. Again that's the reason why we were only able to quantify 3% of the risks to um, towards secure configurations. Um, major dependencies were related to uh, each signer in the hosting environment while the operational dependencies identified were of course on the cloud environment and a little bit on the Ethereum. Some of the critical findings um, we uh, identified were um, as I said, you know, each signer is a major dependency and uh, the each signer source code um, is simply checked into a repository and so we recommend that downloading each signer uh, must be done via verification of appropriate process and so is Bezos source code. Uh, ensure that you are downloading the source code from a, an authoritative source. Um, each signer version should be updated to the most recent version. That's always a recommendation. But even if you didn't, for example, you, you let's just say you implemented, uh, ensure it's not the version 20.10.0 because it was identified to have a, a log4j vulnerability. Um, Bezu configuration uh, critical finding was that it turns off SSL by default. <laughs> so ensure, give it a check. Um, keys should be managed according to the best practices. So key management best practices and control standards are um, at different levels of, um, you know, maturity in processes depending upon the size of the organization and the industry. Um, given that we are a financial services industry and we are heavily regulated, for us it's a, a really critical um, requirement. So we always follow our standard best practices. Um, as advised uh, by our industry standards. Some of the uh, moderate impact findings was um, always start each signer as described in the initialization documentation because initialization is a critical first step. Um, the second one with respect to Bezu configuration is today Bezu um, configuration uses a mix of uh, config file um, as well as the command file. Um, it's known to have resulted in several error prone patterns. 
So what we recommend is preferably use configuration file. Uh, one is it gives you maximum auditability and second thing is for reproducibility of your errors. Um, again, each signer um, could be isolated within the container. It's not a mandatory requirement um, currently. So if you were spinning up a, a node and you were, you know, um, putting them together, if uh, the best practice recommendation is always separate out the, uh, the, uh, the VMs uh, because the events and the event listeners with respect to each signer could process sometimes um, uh, untrusted data. Some of the minor impact findings was again at, at the OS level, the each signer U limit, it's a configuration setting, uh, preferably set the U limits um, 60, 25 or something, that's what the recommendation is. And uh, the default base zone network um, in the config file currently sits nil, like it's empty. Of course, because base U um, can be configured in multiple different ways, uh, but we always recommend set a value to it. Like if you are, you know, using mainnet, then set it as mainnet instead of leaving it as empty. Uh, following, uh, following our critical uh, findings, we also put together some of the configuration best practices. You know, I'll read out for with respect to Hyperledger, Bezu, the tooling, Ethereum, VMs, and cloud. Um, the first one is the Hyperledger Bezu. So as I said, unlike each signer, Bezu is configured to be downloaded in authoritative source. So the repository is, you know for sure, it's an authoritative repository. But by default, the configuration turns off um, TLS. So when you're downloading, um, if you do, are not using secure network communications, then the corresponding hash to um, verify the integrity of the downloaded payload uh, is not available. And this could potentially result in a network level um, attacker that can intercept and supply their own uh, Bezu source code to you. So preferably use some sort of a secure communication channel like TLS and verify the integrity of the downloaded payload. Um, currently, Bezu releases their software every two to three weeks and actually they're pretty good at every two week cycle. So um, ensure you're tracking the upga updates in accordance with the FOSS scans, uh, which is a standard process. Preferably use a scripted build process as a best practice and load balancing. Those are like common best practice tips. When it comes to tooling, um, each signer is a major dependency. Ensure uh, monitoring and best practices uh, is usually using uh, you know, official Docker file instead of you know, downloading the release from a pre-Docker build script. Cloud best practices, um, every organization is vested in their own cloud service provider. Um, whether you're using AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, um, we recommend following the best practices of the cloud service providers, documentation that they provide, uh, and ensure it meets the security and compliance objectives of your company and the industry. And these are standard, um, some of the configuration best practices also applicable for DLT. I mean, they are VM best practices, but also applicable for uh, DLT. Several components must be further privilege separated, um, removes the complexity for um, a compromise. And um, another fact is Ethereum clients generate uh, huge amounts of state, uh, you know, so starting a clean node is very slow. So it would be good to to maintain snapshots of the ETH client state. Um, that is because if, you know, if there is an introduction of some, some sort of a corruption, then the snapshots uh, recovery uh, could be a pretty costly affair. The underlying operating system uh, must be always kept up to date in regards to security patches. Um, again, standard best practice. And uh, configuration best practices when it comes to Ethereum is ensure the boot nodes are carefully audited. Um, several well-known entities maintain boot nodes, um, basic health and uh, safety monitoring of each node's view, not just the nodes that you are spinning up, but also having an understanding of the state of the network and the health of the network is also important. Um, use, use logging and log management, geographically diverse nodes um, as much as possible. Um, check on API, uh, external API usage. Um, always a good idea to keep 
as I said, you know, watch on the state of the Ethereum's health and um, network state. Now, coming back to the glaring 67% risk assessment on smart contracts. I'll repeat again, it's a point in time um, quantifying um, factor. Um, so, the smart contracts, you know, that today um, are a superpower, the power the decentralized applications on Ethereum, they've had security issues um, and there was no good way up until recently to be precise, up until August 22nd, um, there was no good way to understand if a particular smart contract had any sort of security audit or uh, security verification done. But on um, August 22nd, Enterprise Ethereum Alliances um, published a smart contract security audit specification to ensure consistency when it comes to smart contract security. So the publication um, is called um, ETH Trust Security Levels Specification Version 1. It's developed by the ETH uh, Trust Security Levels Working Group. Um, it's a new specification um, that aims at um, certifying a smart contract through a full security audit. And it uh, provides you with three different levels of um, security certification. So depending upon your organization or the size of the organization or the needs of security audit, you could pick and choose um, which level of certification is more apt. Um, and it provides a, you know, a stronger assurance that a smart contract does not have specific security vulnerabilities. The spec also provides some um, basic uh, smart contract best practices. Um, as it says, um, these new vulnerabilities are discovered from time to time. So even if you think you have conducted a security audit on your smart contract, deployed it, it's not the end of the story. You have to constantly keep checking for new vulnerabilities and ensure that those vulnerabilities identified will not impact the functions of the smart contracts that you've deployed. Um, uh, keep checking for the current version as well as the previous version. Um, use latest compiler um, for solidity. Um, d you know, follow the ERC standards um, as well as if you identify or come across a vulnerability that hasn't been reported, uh, please disclose them in a responsible manner. The smart contract um, spec also uh, provides you um, recommendations on making external calls. <clears throat> Normally, exceptions in the um, sub calls bubble up like solidity gives a, a quite a few low level um, low level um, call functions like delegate call static call um, these call functions behave differently as in they return a boolean value um, and indicating whether a call completed successfully or not so if you are not checking for that boolean value um, and if the call fails, then it could potentially lead to an unexpected behavior of the caller contract. Um, use check FX uh, interactions pattern. It ensures that validations of the request and changes to the state variables of the contract are performed before any um, interactions take place. Um, this is important because the scope for reentrancy attacks is reduced significantly if you're doing these checks. Uh, do not use a delegate call um, instruction. Um, it's an external call contract to manipulate the state of the contract. Um, ensure, you know, your tested code is going through these reviews, comes to external call contracts. There are a number of um, known security bugs in uh, various versions in Solidity compiler. Um, some bugs were introduced uh, uh, in known versions. Some were always assumed to have existed previously. Um, the slide you see up here is, you know, compiler bugs that the audit must check for security level S, but then there are uh, recommendations for the other security um, certification levels also, which is M and Q. So always a good idea, um, especially for the developers in the room, ensure that you're, you know, you're going through the spec because it gives you a good knowledge uh, and information on secure coding best practices. Uh, now I will walk through the security levels, certification requirements. This is the, the first or, you know, the, the lowest cadre 
uh, and if you go through this certification and if you have conducted an audit, security audit successfully, you could potentially claim the badge and uh, publicly showcase that you do comply with ETH Trust requirements. And ETH Trust certification is like, like I said, is in available in three um, different levels. Uh, ETH security level S is intended to allow for an unguided automated tool uh, to analyze the the source code and determine if it meets the requirements and some of the standard uh, you know recommendations are like no transaction dot origin um, don't use no self destruct and that actually reminds me of a story um, a few days ago i think on twitter i saw um, there was a post saying am i going to be arrested and it was coming from a developer and he had accidentally called a self-destruct on one of the smart contracts and uh, the naivety of the developer didn't realize and um, well then there was you know a trickle of more uh, annoyed and uh, you know, more messages from other people saying oh my god well, could it was some very very basic knowledge but then again you know it's a developer's fault an error um, ETH Trust certification security level M means that the tested code has been successfully reviewed by a human auditor. Now this is not, this is a little bit about the automated tool and the team is doing a manual analysis and important security issues have been addressed. This level um, includes a number of, um, you know, for this level it, it's assumed that you do meet the lower level S has already been met once the audit has been done by an automated tool, basic requirements, and now you're coming up to the second level, which is level M. And it also has um, the following set of recommendations like um, no, unne no unnecessary uh, Unicode controls, um, declare storage explicitly. That's very, very important. Um, storage variables must be explicitly um, declared. And then um, sources of randomness, that's another recommendation. Um, security level Q, this is the last and you know the, in, in, in the sequence of the orders, this is the highest level uh, verification. Um, this means that you have verified security um, level S and the manual, manual audit at level M. And this uh, certification at this level also means that the intended functionality of the code is sufficiently well documented and its functional correctness is being verified and the code and the documentation has been thoroughly reviewed. Um, this also has uh, some good practices on, you know, code linting and managing gas use increases and the state changes and um, uh, it also mentions no private data. Private data means different for different jurisdictions. So um, check what your jurisdictional private data definition is. Um, if you're in Europe, GDPR means different and if you're in California, those privacy policies are different. Now I want to conclude my talk today with a few things to think about and one of the main things is security should never be an afterthought which is how it is for most of the um, organizations unfortunately today. Um, new security vulnerabilities are getting introduced every minute, every day. So it's always a, a good uh, practice to, to, to one, to, to bring, bring a shift in your organization's thinking and approach. Um, bring a shift in your perspective and collaboration. Ensure you're bringing in the squads together if you have um, security teams. But if you're a small organization and you know there are not, you know, you're lacking of funds to have like a dedicated security practitioner, then, you know, inculcate the thinking security best practices into your development teams. But that thought process has to be initiated in the design and development process itself rather than developing and deploying something in production because what's happening with public permissionless networks is they're like they're live and they're out there and once you have deployed and if you have deployed bad code and it sits like bad code sits on public uh, you know permissionless networks so always a good practice to change that perspective and thinking, bring about consistency in your, um, you know, conducting of your assessments and you know, governance and, you know, see if you can grow the um, security uh, posture and knowledge. 
and educate. Education is really, really critical um, and develop a security strategy program if, if, if possible and encourage the security, um, you know, security education in your organization. Talk to your peers, um, see if you can get some, someone excited about thinking through and, you know, bring them into the security uh, thinking. All right, thank you for your time today. I think that's that's about my time. If you have any um, questions, I'm happy to take them now, but I think I'm up my time. Um, and if you have any questions in regards to the alliances and the collaborations that we have made and interested in participating in any of them, uh, feel free to stop me and reach me and uh, ask me questions. Charles. Uh, thank you.